Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming for this uh, BCSP event, which deals with uh, defense policies of, of the region of the Western Balkans. And um, this is the third time that we are doing this in a row, and we appreciate very much support from Canadian Embassy for really supporting us all these years um, for the implementation of the project. Um, I think this time around uh, we, have, we will have really, really good uh, discussion because we have, I think, VIP guests here uh, and uh, please enjoy. I just want to tell you also that after, immediately after this event, in this room we will have another uh, discussion which deals with our project which is called Safe Haven, where we are um, supporting and assisting and working with um, Russian activists and researchers within the framework of the project, which is called Public Intellectuals at, at Risk, uh, which is supported uh, through Open Society Foundation. And uh, without further ado, I will give floor to Charles Norman, our Canadian ambassador. Okay, Mr. Ambassador, please. Thanks very much, Igor. It's uh, good to be back. Dobro dan. Hello, everyone. Uh, good to see so many familiar faces and colleagues. Uh, it's, been, it's been a year. Um, thank you for participating today. Uh, as Igor said, I'm the ambassador to Serbia, North Macedonia, and Montenegro for Canada. Uh, and this is the third iteration of the Balkan Defense Monitor. At the launch of the first edition, Russia's invasion of Ukraine had just started. And last week, of course, we marked two years since Russia undertook its illegal aggression against a neighbor and peaceful country. And I want to take the opportunity to re reaffirm that Canada's support for Ukraine is unbreakable and unshakable. In fact, our Prime Minister, Mr. Trudeau, was in Kyiv this weekend for the second anniversary to show Canada's solidarity with the Ukraine, with some of our friends. And he announced a further $3 billion in Canadian dollars in assistance to Ukraine at that time. Uh, I want to use this occasion to highlight an initiative, which is the International Coalition for the Return of Ukrainian Children. It was officially launched in Kyiv on February the 2nd, and it's co-chaired by Ukraine and Canada. And the, co the coalition will coordinate joint efforts and cooperation between Ukraine and partner states, those who are interested, to address the unlawful deportation and forced transfer of Ukrainian children by the Russian Federation. So as we move into 2024, time has not only vindicated our support to the Balkan Defense Monitor, but also increased its value and significance. The Monitor provides an overview of annual defense expenditures, strategies, and information about international military cooperation, and also assesses the representation of women in the defense sectors of the six selected countries and transparency generally in the defense sector, all worthy goals and aligned with our priorities and objectives. The Balkan Defense Monitor, in our view, has been particularly valuable because it provides information to counter hostile narratives in the Western Balkan region. And we hope it will continue to act as a rigorous and reliable source of information on defense-related issues in the region. As you all know, the Western Balkans has a complex history of conflict and instability, and has experienced wars, political tension, sorry, ethnic tension and political upheaval, and it's essential to possess a thorough understanding of the defense policies and security dynamics of individual countries to avoid or debunk some of the more alarmist narratives that we're all unfortunately familiar with and to ensure a comprehensive understanding of those regional dynamics. An important example of this is debunking the arms race myth that continues to be perpetuated in the region. So also, the Western Balkans has seen a significant shift in the defense policies over the past decade, from increasing defense expenditures to participation in international military missions. The region has become an important strategic actor in Europe, but also a point of vulnerability, where Kremlin malign propaganda and disinformation factories continue to play a spoiler game. From Canada's perspective, as a non-member country, the Western Balkans becoming fully integrated in the European Union would make the region significantly safer and more stable, something that is important and valuable in our view. And the EU membership would bring increased in economic opportunities and investment and development to the region, leading to greater prosperity and job creation. 
but it also in turn would help alleviate socioeconomic grievances and tensions that can fuel instability and conflict. The Western Balkans would benefit greatly from access to the EU's legal frameworks, institutions and resources and help combat corruption, improve transparency and enhance accountability, including in defense systems. So for the Western Balkans to fully grasp these opportunities and benefits, the, the governments and people of the region must be willing to undertake significant reforms and mindset changes in order to overcome the current stagnation in the process. So we're going to hear today from experts on the region and gain some valuable insights. I think we are in particular really looking to a rich group of panelists, and I hope this discussion and the continuation of the Balkan Defence Minister will lead to a more thorough and objective understanding of the region's defence policies. We've been proud as Canada to support the Balkan Defence Minister over the last three years through our Canada Fund for Local Initiatives, and we hope and anticipate that this valuable work will persevere. Thank you very much. Have a great conversation. Paolo Bruno. Um, good day, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished spe speakers. Um, it is my pleasure to moderate today's debate. My name is Dragana Obradovic and I'm director of uh, Balkan Investigative Network in Serbia. Um, and today we will be actually speaking about the findings of the uh, Balkan Defense Monitor. As you have heard, like it's the third edition that is published this year, but we will try to put basically the questions of defense system and security in the Balkans in the wider European context, in the context of the European uh, stability and safety. So. Basically, I will skip lengthy introductions. Um, you have all heard, like we are featuring this year's um, uh, edition of the Balkan Defense Monitor in the complex geopolitical situation, uh, apart from entering third year of war in Ukraine. Uh, also, there is a war in Gaza. There are many instabilities around the world, basically some of them influencing also in different ways Balkan region and the European stability as such. Um, nevertheless, like one of the findings of the monitor is that the main tendencies uh, pretty much are the same, or let's say trends are pretty much the same which tells us probably something about the decision-making process and kind of inertia um, in defense systems in the region. Um, but then, like I've seen in the report as such, like some interesting tendencies that can tell us uh, a lot about like how the Balkan states and the systems are adjusting to these changed circumstances and this uh, geopolitical, let's say, rivalries that we are seeing um, in the world today. So apart from the number of the exercises which has increased like significantly and the fact that NATO and US basically <coughs> remain the main partners uh, of defenses in the Balkan region like what would be your uh, signals to watch like wh what are the things that you that are telling us basically how the systems are adjusting to these realities it's on brilliant Okay, thank you, Dragana. Well, and thank you, everybody, for coming here. I will uh, just give a few quick uh, takeaways, and uh, so that this is just uh, an initial icebreaker before we dwell into the wider debates about the key findings of this uh, project. When it comes to the key findings of this project, uh, we can absolutely say that when it comes to the who are the key security providers, two names absolutely stick out, NATO and the US. And uh, we are saying this not just uh, because of the fact that four out of the six elected Western Balkan countries are NATO, are member of the alliance, but when we take a look at the key parameters, like for example in case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which are for example military exercises, the key ones are being implemented either with NATO or with uh, key uh, NATO member states, whether it is the US or Turkey or someone else. And even in case of Serbia, which is always considered a regional outlier, we also have a surprisingly strong US slash NATO component, no matter the fact that this is not widely covered in the mainstream media and press in Serbia. 
on this point we can still say the only military exercise in which the US in which Serbia has participated since the beginning of the war in Ukraine has been the Platinum Wolf exercise which Serbian Serbia hosted and which Serbian military co-organized with US European command so this also tells you something also another very big development related to the country which we are currently in is the fact that we have dispatched uh, soldiers with their US counterparts to Sinai, which is a major break compared to the traditional practice of Serbian defense and security policy of only dispatching soldiers to missions which are occurring under the UN or EU auspice. So yes, Serbia's unilaterally declared military neutrality continues to be something of a very strange animal indeed. At the same time, when it comes to the issue of NATO as a security provider, we do see that there is a surprisingly strong commitment by Western Balkan countries to increase their combat readiness and their interoperability in the alliance. Croatia has been particularly interesting given that according both to the website of the Croatian MOD as well as to the plan of military exercises adopted by the Croatian government, that number is significantly higher than last year. Now it's almost 70 military exercises. And so we still don't know, I mean, because we don't have a clear overview, whether how the Croatian is actually marking each, uh, Croatian colleagues are marking each one of these exercises, but still just the sheer number of them is really staggering. On other major important points, yes, we do have the fact that Serbia is still the closest to actually fulfilling NATO requirement of 2% defense spending threshold, despite the fact that it is not a member of the alliance, even though that percentage will probably drop below 2%. We have the fact that some other countries are desperately trying to catch up, like Albania and North Macedonia while on the other hand Bosnia is, uh, is uh, still uh, struggling on that front. The representation of women, well, there is still work to be done, but at the same time we do have uh, individual areas where we can be pleased about it. And uh, at the same time we also can be say that not good but not terrible on the transparency front, where there are areas where some countries, particularly Albania, which didn't respond to our freedom of information request, can do much more to work. And on the other hand, there are those countries like Serbia, Croatia, and Montenegro, which there is a definitely place to improve, even though I will tell right away, Croatia has been on, on top when it comes to the game of defense transparency in the region. This was perhaps a little bit uh, swift and perhaps a chaotic overview, but this is after all uh, just an introductionary icebreaker. And I expect that we will dwell deeply into this issue and perhaps even beyond that in the coming period. Thank you. Thank you, Vuk. Vuk Usanovic was a senior researcher uh, on this study, and I'm sure that throughout the debate he will use the opportunity to you know, quote many of the findings um, of, of the monitor that was published actually today, so you can find it online as of today. Um, but I will, I will just move the chair, because I would like to see my speakers, first of all. Like, I'm not really happy with this setting, so... Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so what we have heard now is that there is actually strong commitment from the Balkan states, uh, let's put it that way, to the Western security systems, like in the first place, United States and the NATO. Um, and considering like EU's efforts to also put itself on a, on a map as security provider, basically, I was wondering, like, where does the Europe see the place also of the Balkan countries? We know for some of them that the EU is a partner, is for some of the countries the biggest donor. I think Macedonia is uh, one of them. But how is the place um, of the Balkans in this security architecture, future security architecture assessed? Probably this could be a, a question uh, better asked towards EU officials, but as someone who has worked with uh, uh, EU officials on various, uh, on various never their forte and and uh, the 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 European involvement in security domains was uh, predominantly through political reforms issues dealing with internal vulnerabilities and they have been a champion 
in that respect. But uh, for example, as a Minister of Defense, uh, I did not have that many interactions because uh, actually it wasn't until the Russian attack on Ukraine that uh, European Union decided to, to up their ambitions and to reposition themselves when it comes to defense. And uh, currently it's, it's interesting to hear the president of the European Commission saying that in her potential second mandate as president, uh, she's definitely going to nominate someone as a defense commissioner. And this is uh, an incredible difference compared to the European Union of five years ago. Uh, on the other side, if you look at the Western Balkan, uh, this was the region where EU flexed its military muscle first. Uh, it was actually Macedonia in that time where the first EU military mission was sent immediately after our ethnic conflict in 2001. And actually their experience with this mission was rather successful. Uh, in the case of uh, North Macedonia or Macedonia then, we were probably the test case that when there is a good cooperation between NATO and EU, actually uh, success can be remarkable. We have had several NATO missions, NATO presence, and then followed by EU missions that have really helped stabilize the country. So uh, I, I do believe that the heightened ambition on behalf of the European Union is a good sign for the region. And uh, I also think that uh, we should be more involved in drafting that landscape. But if I, if I remember correctly the discussions that we have had when we joined NATO a few years ago, uh, uh, we, I, I think we made the right call 30 years ago because uh, we also took into account that probably the most sensitive area on the European continent will be what I think Kapchan called the, the Europe gray zones, the land between NATO and Russia. And our, our choice was always to avoid the gray zone because this region was kind of grayish for, for a long period of time. So uh, deciding to, to, to push forward our NATO agenda after a delay due to the Greek veto of 10 years was the right call. And being able to enter into the alliance just in time prior to the NATO aggression, I think uh, created a sense of security for North Macedonia before the aggression took over. And this was one of the reasons why even the 2% threshold was not as unpopular as some, some people believed. We started with below 1% in 2017 and moving towards 1.8 this year, and uh, last year, and hopefully 2% uh, next year. Uh, but it was, uh, uh, I think, accepted also by our, uh, our citizens as an investment in security. Because if there is one thing that we have seen after uh, the attack on Ukraine, is that without security, all is nothing. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and everything collapses. Yeah. But <clears throat> today we are in Serbia. Serbia is not uh, the member of, of the NATO. Um, officially, at least, we don't have such ambitions. Um, so basically the question, maybe Srđan Cvić can answer to that one, is whether we can look at the European security architecture outside of the framework of the enlargement in the NATO. Yeah, that's a very important question, especially having in mind where we are, as you said, in Serbia, because uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, I'm going just to mention this as a side note. Um, when uh, our organization uh, conducted opinion polls uh, in early 2000s, so maybe a year or two after uh, the NATO bombing of the Fry, then um, uh, 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 the support for Serbia joining NATO was close to 30 percent. And uh, so it means that the generations that were bombed by NATO uh, directly and uh, supported more NATO than today what we have. And I think uh, we all know what is the consequence, uh, what, uh, what, what this is a consequence of. Because since 2012 uh, we have a constant uh, daily uh, drip of anti-Western propaganda coming from all um, uh, government uh, medias that certainly created, contributed to this atmosphere where now the support for Serbia joining NATO is 5-7%. It's in single-digit numbers anyways. So the question is, 
is it possible to have Serbia, Bosnia, because of the Republic of Srpska, in a way, Kosovo as well, uh, with other countries of the Western Balkans in a common security ar architecture and what that architecture may be, if not NATO. Is really neutrality an option when we see that uh, 700 kilometers away from, na from us we have uh, uh, a war of aggression? is neutrality we often confuse in serbia in the public discourse i think uh, neutrality within the independent foreign policy independent foreign policy means that um, you as a sovereign state define your foreign policy which doesn't have to be neutrality it can be alignment and in fact in this situation this is my personal opinion but uh, it seems that uh, our neutrality looks more like being a trojan horse to some eastern interest in this region so the question is how to do it is it possible to have some sort of a regional cooperation in the field of security like we do in the field of economy in, within the framework of the Berlin process or even the Open Balkans. So is it possible to have Serbia in that? We have historical precedence. <laughs> well, we have historical precedence when we don't have something to clinch on right now. You can look at the past and um, uh, back in the 50s, uh, 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 then um, Socialist Federative Republic of Yugoslavia was for a very short period of time in a military alliance with uh, Turkey and Greece that were at that point for a year NATO members. So a socialist communist country was in a military alliance against, uh, uh, well, uh, that was built. And why? Because there was a common perception of a threat. The question is, do we have a common perception of a threat here? Now, that's actually the big question, like what is our perception of the threat and how is actually that perception created? Like that's, I think, one of the main, uh, of the main issues, but we will come back to the, I'm just wondering if uh, Mr. Harun Tsero is with us, um, hello, participating Hi. online from uh, Bosnia, from Sarajevo. Welcome to, to the panel. I hope you had a chance to hear what our previous speakers uh, said. Um, speaking from Bosnia, which opposite to Serbia that we have heard uh, is spending two percentages uh, of GDP on the army is actually considered to be uh, like the strongest of all militaries in, in the region, let's put it that way, at least when you look at the parameters, Bosnia uh, is on the other side of this scale, like spending less than one percentage, having, as I have seen, strategic documents from early 2000s, uh, not really working on updating its security and defense strategies. Uh, would the accession process, like the invitation that came along with the crisis in Ukraine to, to Bosnia, basically create some impulse also for the defense sector in Bosnia? Is it possible to expect that? Yeah, on the, on the, uh, first of all, thank you, thank you for uh, having me. Um, I mean, the, the political or the constitutional structure of Bosnia makes it, makes it difficult for, for Bosnia to, to invest more in the state, in state defense, unlike, uh, unlike uh, I mean, when you look at the, 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 the local conditions or police and, or the federal police or the police of Republika Srpska, uh, I mean, of course, uh, when it comes to the to the Euro-Atlantic integration, Bosnia uh, is in the membership action plan. We uh, delivered the second the second program of uh, reforms uh, most most recently, and I think still a, a part of the country hopes that um, someday uh, Bosnia will be a member of the NATO, so both the EU and the and the NATO, but. As, 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 as I said, um, in terms of uh, defense spending, uh, 
most most of the uh, of the of the funds are 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 spent at 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 the at the personnel so at the military personnel so basically for the most basic conditions uh, of of the staff in the army and um, it is below 1% it's it's not it's not uh, uh, big enough and i think i think uh, in the future there should be uh, con considerations also for bosnia to somehow uh, enhance uh, the defense uh, def def defense uh, uh, budget because I think uh, this would also kind of uh, bind the country and not the other way around. It wouldn't uh, it wouldn't uh, separate her uh, separate the separate the country additionally, but um, would would definitely uh, uh, bind bind the country because I think in in, in Bosnia uh, e each and every issue where you can basically work together or work work to, to, to build something up is 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 is, is a good thing. But um, when we of course there are there are or at least when you when you when you look at the public there are uh, um, uh, fears of the of the mentioned uh, arms race in the region especially especially when it comes to 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 to, to serbia and 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 um and and croatia and i mean you can see the uh, uh you can see also the fears when it comes to this when uh, i mean a good example of this is to 2021 when there was there was a military exercise announced between Serbia and Bosnia, and um, that was still in the pand pandemic, but uh, like uh, days before the exercise, it was cancelled because uh, there was fear that uh, you know the, the, the Serbian troops on the ground in Bosnia. Uh, uh, would use the opportunity basically to to kind of uh, check the, the the landscape. So these are insecurities which we have to un overcome somehow. And I think uh, more uh, visits from defense officials to Bosnia from Serbia or to to Bosnia from Croatia and other way around would surely contribute to. Uh, to uh, to, uh, to to more understanding and and uh, more 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 uh, cooperation in in, in, in that that yeah. sense. And not to disregard what Sergeant mentioned, like recognizing who is uh, the threat um, um, jointly, like uh, that that uh, and consensus about that definitely for Bosnia um, would be, I guess, one of the crucial of the crucial things. Um, but speaking about Serbia. Uh, Vuk, I wanted to ask you, like, by all parameters, as we said, like, Serbia uh, probably is investing the most uh, in, in its arms, uh, in the equipment, not just in the personnel, trying to put itself on a map as a leading yeah, security power um, in the region. And basically, speaking about that, like, the rationale behind it, I'm wondering, like, is it purely security or basically this notion of the arms race uh, that Harun just mentioned um, has roots that are more, let's say, like in daily politics or populism, considering how potent this topic is among, among the Serbian population? Well, we have to remind everybody that while everybody talks about the, this, I like to call it quasi-arms race, not an arms race, everybody talks about this process in the context of uh, ongoing war in Ukraine. But this process has been ongoing for years before the war in Ukraine, starting back in 2015, precisely between the two dominant uh, countries in this process, which were Serbia and uh, Croatia. Uh, if you're asking me what is this process about, I will tell you, and I think that Serbia is a microcosmos, although you can definitely find probably in Croatia similar or analogous logic. I think this is a multidimensional process. On one hand, yes, we should still be realistic about one thing, that most of the arsenals of Western Balkan countries, with the exception of Albania, of course originates from the day of ex-Yugoslavia and Yugoslav people's army. So after two or three decades, it is not unnatural that you have to buy something new. And on this process, of course, we can say that, yes, both Serbia and Croatia and others are internationally recognized countries. They have a right to maintain their armed forces. 
you cannot tell neither one of them that they should uh, guarantee their security with stones and slingshots in the 21st century. But this process should be done in a less uh, toxic fashion. And this, of course, comes to the second two elements, which is not just purely defensive and security rationale of this process, but there is also uh, a component of foreign policy, as well as the component of domestic, poli domestic politics. In terms of foreign policy, we have to rewind the clocks back to the original Ukraine crisis of 2014. In this process, I mean, Serbia and the other Western Balkan countries drew completely different uh, conclusions from this process. Most of the other Western Balkan countries believed that this was a good opportunity to affirm their loyalty to the West and to demonstrate that they are some form of bulwark against Russian influence in the Balkans. Well, on the other hand, the Serbian lesson from this crisis was to play the old neo titoist game of playing off Russia and the West against each other. So that was, of course, the foreign policy component. The elites in Belgrade believe if we are armed, if we are well armed, our neighbors will take us more seriously in regional disputes and it will be much more easier for us to balance between power blocks in the European security, NATO and Russia. At the same time, there is also a very powerful uh, domestic political component to it. If we are to see public opinion polls, traditionally, the army is the second most trusted institution in society after the Serbian Orthodox Church. We have a culture where the where army is being uh, identified with the, with the notion of nationhood, where the army is being perceived not just as a national institution, but also as something of a pedagogical, nurturing institutions, where which uh, transforms boys into men, which does the job which is uh, primarily intended for the family and educational system. And at the same time, so yes, if you are being seen as investing in the armed forces, you can definitely score domestic mileage by primarily showing. If, if you are taking picture with buying good toys for your army, then you are the father of the nation who takes care of your army and of your people. So this type of... Uh, and uh, this is another example of how everything has become, in a way, an instrument of domestic politics and domestic political marketing. Yep. So this is only, it is never a one-dimensional process. Um, but staying um, in the same domain of debanking, as Mr. Ambassador said, like alarmist, narratives and arms race is probably uh, one of them. Uh, there's been a lot of talk last year about the reintroduction of the mandatory conscription in Serbia. Recently we have heard uh, same announcements coming from Croatia. Uh, is there anything uh, in the trends that you observed that basically gives the ground to such announcements because we are hearing them for years now. Uh, in the expenditure, for example, because I remember uh, like in 2024, like more money will be spent on the personnel, like in percentages, or maybe the fact that we have also announced this concept of the total defense, like which probably lays upon uh, the, the, the conscription, yeah? Like, uh, you will need people for that. So how are you reading these signals? Yes. Well, if we are talking about uh, defense expenditure as an indication of anything, a very important point is not just how much you spend as percentage of your GDP, but a very important point is the structure of this spending. For years, US has been angry at its uh, NATO allies for being uh, free riders. That's Uncle Sam calling, you better take the call. <laughs> Don't worry, they, it happened to me once while I was on television, so, <laughs> so luckily they were recording. But uh, to, to return to Uncle Sam, for years the U.S. has been complaining about the defense expenditure of their allies. However, as the time passed, they realized that it is also the nature of this expenditure. A very important part is that one-third of these 2% of national GDP is being spent on equipment. Because over the years we have seen many NATO members who did all kinds of bookkeeping tricks in order to please US by just formally having those 2%. In case of our neighbor Croatia, I mean at one point they unified of course defense budget with the pensions of their war veterans as well as with the as well as with the purchase of uh, Rafale jets from the US and they said we have passed the 2% thresholds. 
For years, UK has unified both their defense budget as well as their budget for the intelligence agency into a single whole in order to say to the US, we spend 2% of our GDP on defense. So there are all sorts of tricks that uh, individual NATO member states were doing. In case of Serbia, yes, as I said, if Serbia were hypothetically to be a member of NATO, it would have been a very, very good member precisely because one third of its defense expenditures went on procuring new, new equipment. But this year we do have something that now the percentage of, uh, def of expenditures for both personnel and for equipment has been almost equal. And that, I believe, is the key problem of the Serbian national defense system, which is departure of the professional military cadre from the military as a result of unsatisfying salary and unsatisfying work culture, which, they, which the armed personnel list as their number one reasons for leaving the armed forces. According to the Serbian military union, in the past five years or so, 10,000 military professionals have left the army for private sector in search of better opportunities. So, while I cannot judge on whether the announced return of conscription service in Serbia will be implemented, I remain highly skeptical of it, primarily because it costs a lot. But if you were to ask me what are the two primary motives for these announcements, I would say number one, try to artificially repair the, project, the problem which occurred with the departure of the professional personnel from the military, and number two, promote yourself to your own constituents. And is this, um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to clear this, like this concept of the total defense that was also announced, like what it entails actually, what it, what it means, total well, defense, like sounds a bit threatening to the people that are not actually from the military, right? Well, this is a one million dollar question because everybody evokes this concept, uh, concept but no one defines it. I mean, as the word, the trick is in the name, total means that the, the total, the totality of society is mobilized in case of military emergency. However, the countries which implement this concept, they are very, very different. We have neutral countries like Switzerland and up until recently Sweden, but we also have NATO member states like Norway who apply the concept, but we also have countries like, for example, Singapore. But if we just take a look, no one actually defines what it means in the case of Serbia. I mean, just take a look. One NATO member state, Serbia is not a NATO member state. We have neutral countries, but these are neutral countries based on the, which, whose neutrality status is recognized in public international law. Serbian neutrality is based on a unilateral declaration from the Serbian National Assembly. We have Singapore, which is actually a city-state with a high per capita income in a highly geopolitically volatile region of being stuck in between two giants, US and China. So it is very, very difficult to find the right analogy for a country like Serbia, both in geopolitical, economic, and any other term with the total defense. At the same time, when the Serbian leaders say total defense, does the total defense only involve uh, drafting personnel and having, person, uh, having, your, having your population undergo a military training, or does that go mobilizing other resources in the society? What will be the role of private companies? Will they have to put, for example, their own resources at the, at the disposal of the state in these circumstances? What will be the role of national health system like the hospitals? What will be the role of national educational uh, institutions? Will the university momentarily organize themselves so that the students can be drafted in the case of the emergency? How will, for example, schools handle underage children in, the, in those circumstances? What will be the role of non-profit organizations? So, the, the word total defense is being floated around, but no one actually defines what it means and how will it be implemented in a country like Serbia. Yeah, but exactly. I think like the key is in the country like Serbia, and that is what resonates maybe so bad, bad in the neighborhood. So I will just use, and I, if I can see Mr. Kirinska, sorry, like, <laughs> um, I wanted basically to ask you, um, first of all, how, when you hear like Serbia is preparing to uh, adopt the concept of the total defense and then and, and, uh, re-announce uh, conscription, like how that sounds uh, in Macedonia and considering that you're a NATO member uh, and all the benefits that it brings, like 
does that sound as, as a threat, actually, or not really? It is fashionable these days to discover new threats, but uh, our neighborhood was never seen as a direct threat in this sense. So even the, the, the discussions uh, that took place in Serbia transferred to Mo North Macedonia, but more as a dilemma, should we do the same? You know, it is fashionable in certain circles to talk about the good old days, right? And it's more uh, a nostalgia than a rational assessment. I remember talking to, to quite a number of, of, of generals, experienced generals in, in Macedonian army uh, about these ideas, because they have flown around the country as well, even a few years ago, prior to 2022. Uh, and I fully agree with Vuk. Uh, basically, it was this uh, concept that uh, actually our youngsters are not educated or trained enough. We need to put them, uh, put, put them in the system. We need to train them. We need to, uh, we need to drill them. And uh, uh, I, I, I remember the discussions with them, and all of them were extremely against the idea. They have the experience with conscription. They consider it costly, time-consuming, and no efficient when it comes to defense. Uh, practically, uh, North Macedonia had seen a decline in defense spending after we stopped conscription, 2005. We were above 2% at that time, but in terms of equipment, in terms of efficiency, in terms of defense capabilities, basically we were wasting our resources on, on something completely unnecessary. So there is no, uh, definitely no, no appetite in North Macedonia now to go back uh, in spite of these ideas among a small circle of, uh, of, of people. Uh, generally speaking, our experience has been uh, that the focus on increased defense spending, at least in our case, and I do believe that Croatia could be, could be similar, is not so much related to the renewed interest in security, but generally it derives from our NATO obligations. You know, suddenly, you know, the 2%, we could not move to 2% immediately. We, we had to practically plan to slowly increase the, the spending and slowly change the, 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 the structure of the spending. When you have low uh, defense expenditure like Bosnia or like us prior to 2017, below 1%, it's clear that most of your money will go to personnel yeah. because that's just the expenses that you cannot uh, do without. But then, as you start increasing your defense spending, actually, you have to focus on equipment because that's where the, real, the, the big money really goes to. And uh, I, I believe that uh, because our defense planning is now part of the NATO defense planning, I consider it more rational, more results-oriented, and more part of a big structure. So you're not putting your expenses, you're not putting your money on the same expenses, on the on, on same, same equipment that actually you cannot profit from. I remember the discussions that we have had years ago about the procurement of a, a 3D radar. It was incredibly costly, and the key question that we got from the NATO planners was, okay, you locate a, a flying object above your sky after spending millions and millions, and then what do you do? <laughs> what are the planes that you call? What are the planes that you will engage? So uh, I, I, I think it, uh, you know, this is where the alliance kicks in. This is the advantage. You don't double, you spend only on areas where you consider you have a certain capacity. In the case of North Macedonia, it's infantry. And then you also add elements that you need for national uh, uh, purposes. But what worked very much in, in our case was uh, an increase in transparency in defense spending. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's actually the only thing that can save you from public outcry if you start increasing your defense spending. Uh, the, the Ministry of Defense became the most transparent institution in North Macedonia in the course of three years. And we have re they have remained the, the first position in the course of three or four years. But do you just briefly expect that with political change potentially in North Macedonia, mm -hmm. This could change. This could change. Uh, yeah, expect the unexpected, you know, and, and in <laughs> politics even more so. Uh, I, I had uh, this, this crazy idea that no government changes what works well, but I was proven wrong. <laughs> so I'm, I, I don't dare come up with that assessment. Uh, on the other side, NATO membership has been seen 
as a stabilizing, constructive, positive factor in the country. In spite of all the other divides, you know, still a good segment of our society is happy about this. And I do believe that uh, even in case of political changes, a certain kind of commitment will remain. Plus, the good thing about big, these big procurements of equipment is you take an oath. You cannot escape afterwards the obligations of paying your debts. But uh, I think that you know, the only way it can work is that if you increase defense spending for equipment, you improve working conditions for your personnel. In the case of North Macedonia, we have actually solved the problem of losing your, your officers or, or soldiers by really drama dramatically increasing their, their income. And this is why NATO membership continued to be uh, very attractive within the army, because they have seen their salaries grow, they can go to more exercises. I, I, I read the monitor mm -hmm. and I believe that some of these things are actually interconnected. Because we have increased defense spending, we can afford to send more people to, to uh, exercises. We can afford to send more people to, to international uh, missions. Otherwise, without the money, actually, it's a, it's, it's a uh, no-go. Uh, but with increased defense spending, I think the Balkans can strive to be not only good at a regional level, but go good at a European level. And yeah, I will tell you our basically. example. Yeah, yeah I, I will tell you our example. The Transparency International came to North Macedonia several years ago, and they initiated uh, an assessment on defense integrity. And it was a bit tricky. I mean, you start the assessment and you never know what will be the end result. So it's politically really a, a risky operation. And then it turned out that uh, on, on, on the index of defense integrity for Central and Eastern Europe, not Balkans, not Southeastern Europe, all Central and Eastern Europe, Macedo uh, North Macedonia turned out to be number two, only after Latvia. And, and I think it was a major source of pride and confidence building to say, okay, we are not just competing among the five or six nations, we can actually aspire for more. And it did create a sense of confidence also within the army that even when they spend these big amounts of money, they will it's not worth, be yeah. under the scrutiny of yeah. doing something rotten because these kinds of procurements are usually a dead end for political careers and military careers. Yeah. But because of this and because of the, the, the NATO run defense planning or NATO supported defense planning pro progress process, I think it was easier for key experts within the Ministry of Defense to be certain that their assessments are the right ones. They're not just buying toys. No. They're buying something that A, can be used and B, can be maintained, which is, I think, the key problem for all our militaries. Yeah. Buying it, it's, it's actually the easier part. Using it, maintaining it, keeping it fit is actually yeah. uh, trickier. Trickier, exactly. Uh, and we can see in many countries, like maintenance is actually the smallest portion uh, uh, of the budget, at least according to, to the monitoring. Um, uh, Srjan, I wanted to ask you uh, to bring, like I know that Kosovo is not part of the monitoring, but I want to bring it into the picture like briefly, because speaking now about the arming, like we had last year the situation that basically United States sold um, arms to, to the Kosovo. It, reaction from Serbia, of course, uh, was quite, quite, quite loud. But um, my question is, can arming secure some balance of powers? Like, what are the underlying reasons uh, um, behind that decision? Um, is, does that go uh, along the idea of creating Kosovo army at the end? I mean, I think we come back to the question of uh, how do we see the future politically in this region? And uh, Ambassador was talking about European integration. So uh, we see this contradictory processes. On the one hand, we're all striving towards EU membership, uh, Kosovo included. On the other hand, uh, we are... Um, uh, using uh, bellicose uh, political language and, and you know on both sides really you know so i think you know if you look at serbia uh, this uh, constant uh, uh, reference to uh, nagorno karabakh to uh, this infatuation with uh, the processes there are in stark contradiction to uh, 
the professed uh, uh, strategic goal of Serbia to join the EU, of which regional cooperation is one of the uh, important elements, right? So in that context, uh, uh, yes, I mean, of course, uh, 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 arming uh, the other side uh, can provide some sort of a balance. You're referring to the javelin uh, uh, yeah, uh, sales, but I think the question is why? are we doing this, really? What are the plans of the political leadership here and uh, the political leadership there? Why are we arming ourselves? Because uh, I think there is also a very stark contradiction to the uh, mood of the population, which on both sides is not really conducive to conflict, right? Nobody wants conflict. This is not the first thing that people have on their mind here, neither there. It seems that uh, the political leadership is excelling in this, uh, in a way. So um, I think these are very dangerous processes. And again, it drives us back to the question of uh, can we have some sort of a consensus when we talk about security of a common thread? Because, you know, we can see other uh, powers operating in the region as well, you know, so uh, that is destabilizing for most governments, including this government here, uh, despite the, you know, public rhetoric. So uh, yeah, exactly. can we focus on that rather than... Uh, um, you know, fighting the atavistic battles that are not in the national interest of the countries. Uh, yeah, here but I there. think like instrumentalizing the security concerns is basically related more to domestic uh, political goals and, and maybe um, creating like position in the international community where you are, everybody knows Serbia is sitting on two chairs, three chairs, how many chairs actually? <laughs> so um, that, that's actually a question for, for Vuk maybe to tell us, like obviously there's no Russia in the report after the Ukraine. Um, we stopped all military and, and security cooperation, at least uh, officially. You cannot see it in the, in the reports. Uh, but there are some other actors like China, like Turkey. Um, what is their role? in the region and uh, is this the role that is uh, let's say conductive is it positive does it contributes to what we are talking about like our european aspirations and then uh, playing more significant role in this european security architecture or not really yes well since the beginning of the ukraine war serbia has been forced to tone down many of its uh, ties with russia and it has been particularly conspicuous in the field of uh, military affairs and uh, defense. Because recently, President Vucic uh, flashed out an electronic, uh, an electronic defense system intended for uh, drones, which is Russia manufactured. I mean, who knows which type of channels he had to use to have these systems delivered to Serbia. But even that is political flashing. Let's face it, the big toys that we already paid for in advance, like helicopters and tanks from Russia, they are not coming here now that NATO and EU territory is blocked for the Russian transport. So that those are not coming. At the same time, yes, we are seeing something of a process in which other players like China and Turkey can profit partially from the vacuum which emerged on this eastern, non-western part of the equation by the fact that Russia is bogged down in Ukraine. Of course, when it comes to China, we have to underscore some points. This is their attempts to be more involved in the uh, defense sector in the Western Balkans is not necessarily a novelty. In between 2008 and 2018, China was the second biggest military donor to Serbia after the United States. So period between 2008 and 2018. At the same time, some of the most high-profile military transactions which took place between China and Europe related to Serbia. Drones and missile defense system. Of course, a very big uh, question will be whether now that the MiGs are about to become obsolete, what will be Serbian alternative? Whether it will be something very expensive, like Rafal jets. We know Mr. Macron won't object uh, selling them to both Belgrade and Zagreb, it is business after all. 
but it is also an issue of pricing and J2 is a very suitable replacement. However, it will still open up another elephant in the room, which is the United States. Will, the, will Serbia become too embroiled in Sino-American Cold War as a result if it becomes overly dependent on, on Chinese military industry and military equipment? So this is one, one of the big questions. I mean, even the fact that, for example, the biggest donor of Serbia in this year was China, but this was based on the agreement of which we know very little about because the only information on this transaction was the one contained in the freedom of information request we, we got from the Serbian MOD. No, it is not present in the public domain, so we don't know the actual content of this, of this donation by China. So this might very well be something of, uh, which will be one of the key challenges of global security. I'm not talking about our little corner of the globe, I'm talking really globally. Literally for every state which is in between, it will be a key question of how you navigate in the world of Sino-American rivalry, in which, which, is the, which will be the key dominant geopolitical and security trend of the 21st century. So, seeing this, that on one hand China is, was the biggest military donor in this year, while at the same time most of the other major international military cooperation projects took place with the US, like military exercises and military missions, that might be a sign of things to come, in which small countries try to hedge their bets in the age of Sino-American rivalry. And of course, we have another player, which is Turkey. I think that Turkey has also profited for, as a result of the war in Ukraine, because one thing that Turkey has, which Russia and China do not have in the region, is the one that is frequently being overlooked. Turkey is partially, not fully, but partially part of the West by being a member of NATO. So unlike Russia and China, it can brand its policies in the Balkans, both foreign and defense policies, quite differently than these two players. Someone complains about Turkey, they will say, well, what do you want? We are del delivering weapons, but it is a NATO standard weapons. So it is not Russia or China. And at the same time, I also think that we have seen this not just in the case of Certain weapon systems, of course, the most popular one being Turkish drones, which have been delivered to Albania and Kosovo. But I also think that this is also uh, Turkish participation in regional peacekeeping. The bulk of K4 reinforcements have been the Turkish soldiers, and now it is being led at this moment in time by a Turkish general. And this also tells you some of the benefits that Turkey can extract. Communication between two Serbian and Turkish ministries of defense. The dominant issue on the table is the role of K4 in Kosovo. Who, who does Kurti consult regularly? Turkish general who is at the helm of, helm of K4. So this tells you something about Turkey's modus operandi. You insert yourself in regional security provision and you basically open your doors of communication with both of the key ethnic groups in the Balkans, both potentially wanting to be on good terms, at least politically, with Turkey as a result of Turkey having boots on the ground. And this is very, very different than Russia, which since 2003 has no military boots on the ground, which is also always being overlooked, surprisingly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we don't have much time, so I would just like to invoke to, to call for Harun um, to join us briefly um, and to discuss one another aspect um, of the security in the region uh, often overlooked and that's cyber security. Um, there's been a lot of attacks on uh, critical infrastructure uh, in Albania, we've seen recently in Montenegro, uh, also in Serbia and but this, still, this topic doesn't have, at least in defense circles, is not publicly that much communicated. Like, why, why is that so? Is there a role for military and defense, like in the cyber security? Uh, and why you think it is not still on the table? Like, based on the report mm -hmm. we've seen, like there were several of exercises, and uh, I think Albania is setting up uh, cybersecurity um, operational center, but more or less that's it. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. I would like, if you allow, just to briefly comment, just very briefly, what the, what the colleagues said before about insecurities, insecurities, etc. So basically, I, I, I agree with the most most of the things that have been said, and just very briefly, I would say, I mean, if you recapitalize, there are two ways. One is boosting the militaries in the region, and uh, but in this case, make it proportional. So, or not even proportional, proportional because of the budgets and the and the different circumstances in each country, but make it semi-proportional. In this way, if you have countries in the region who are balanced out in terms of uh, military power, then uh, you will definitely have a more stable region. The second way is um, to re-evaluate the, uh, the um, um, uh, the sub-regional uh, arms control agreement that we that was signed 1996 in, in, in Florence, and it's uh, part of the Dayton Peace Agreement. So basically, this this agreement wasn't uh, it's it's still in power, and it uh, it uh, it is. Um, it, it, it wasn't violated in that sense by any of the countries in the region until now, but what it needs it's, it, it is an update, uh, which includes drones, etc. So we're talking about Kosovo and Albania getting getting drones, etc. So uh, uh, these are the two ways we need we need on, on the one one side there can be a boosting of militaries, but it has to be a proportional, and on the other side, if we don't go that way, then uh, then there needs to be some rearrangements in terms of of regional regional security and and the agreements. And a problem also here is is and also a huge problem that creates insecurities uh, is also on this micro level um, caused by individuals who have a war past and are still present, unfortunately, in the military and security structures of the regional countries and who openly support nationalistic ideas and ter territorial expansion, etc. And uh, they're uh, mentioning that in every, basically every speech, almost every speech. Uh, so th th these are three things that I would just like to kind of uh, put, put out there in terms of, of, of the previous discussion. And now to, to, um, to come to your question, and thank you, uh, thank you for that. So, I mean, it's clear that the Western Balkans region, but it's, it's the same for, for actually whole Europe is uh, grappling with the increase, increasing threat from cyber attacks and their, their impact in critical infrastructure and government entities. Um, here, a significant challenge is uh, the absence of a unifying governance framework for cybersecurity. So this makes um, how to say cross-border defense more difficult. So there, there is no regional, so to say, common approach when it comes to cyber um, cybersecurity attacks. But there, uh, we come back to what Serjan was 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 also like talking about what is actually what what the individual countries uh, look, look at as a, as a threat or, or from 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 whom uh, so um, uh, the problem is basically that each country has uh, uh, its own set of cybersecurity laws and regulations and that makes it really difficult to co to coordinate uh, a response a common common response I mean, Bosnia here is a, a, a very interesting uh, case. I mean, the, the, the country lacks a nation, national or state level uh, cyber security strategy, and there's no national computer emergency response team. So there's no centralized, basically, point of, of contact for, for cyber, cyber threat um, intelligence um, sharing. So, um, I mean, when we look at 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 at, at this uh, cyber dimension, there are two. There are basically two two pillars. So the one is uh, the cyber crimes, basically, uh, where organized criminal groups operate from countries like Albania, Kosovo, Montenegro, and they're often very well uh, funded and sophisticated, and um, they also pose a huge security threat. And then there's there are nation state actors. So um, what is interesting, and I would like to put this out there, is like uh, from according to the data from 2000, 
2022, Bosnia witnessed uh, 9.2 million cyber security threats. And like countries like Brazil were pinpointed as primary source of these cyber attacks, followed by countries like Netherlands, US, Russia, uh, Bangladesh, Germany, Costa Rica, etc. But this can be misleading because the attackers oft often employ VPNs so to hide their um, location. So um, basically, since the beginning of the of the of the uh, Russian Russian aggression on Ukraine, uh, the cybersecurity funds from the NATO and the EU, EU have increased. Um, and um, uh, but still, I mean. Um, the Western Balkans countries, as I said at the beginning, are not an individual case of, of not coping well with cybersecurity threats. I mean, good examples are uh, the 2007 onslaught against Estonia, then we had most recently 2021, the attack on the Bundestag, and three years before, or four years before, we had another uh, attack on the Bundestag and and uh, it, it, it uh, and the the countries like Germany and Estonia didn't cope well with these um, with these uh, yeah. attacks. So basically, uh, just to conclude, um, the fact is that until now many sectors have uh, chronically under invested in cybersecurity in the region. Um, since I mean, security investments do not in that sense bring profit but rather prevent loose. So um, basically to conclude, uh, there's still a lot, lot of work to be, to be done uh, in, this, in this field. And if I understand correctly, like your approach would be more regional cooperation as in other things like uh, probably. Of course. Yeah. Um, we have 15 more minutes and I would like to open the floor uh, for guests if there are any questions that you would like to ask our panelists. Because if not, I have more, so that's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so if there are no questions from the panel, and I really invite you to think about it and use the opportunity. Um, going back to the European uh, um, security architecture, I, I, I'm basically I was thinking about the role that the Balkan already actually has as a, a gatekeeper of the outside border of the EU um, and I'm, this is the question for whoever wants to answer like but how is the role of the Balkans in that respect assessed like how reliable partner we are actually if we are we, we, we play the role of geography uh, we are not the protector of the external border we are a protector of an internal border uh, we are surrounded by EU member states mm -hmm. and uh, this is why it you know it, it, our geopolitical relevance is sometimes tricky because of this. Uh, we, can, we are not protecting the external border, like Romania and Poland, eh? but we are also not, uh, not protecting them on the south. But we are the pathway towards Europe. And uh, recently, I, I think it, it became clear that since migration is still seen, as one of the big make or break points for the European Union, uh, the, the relevance of the Western Balkans in security is very much seen also through the migration lens. And if the European Parliament approves of the new regulation uh, with regards to the growth facility and the reforms uh, expected of the Western Balkans, uh, uh, then they contain migration elements as well. What I saw in the, the last draft uh, was an addition probably done by some of the member states where the reform agenda is not just the typical rule of law, media, uh, institutions, administration, etc., etc., but also migration movements. Uh, so from that point, I think the Western Balkans still holds relevance in a security aspect. Of course, the second one is that still we are seen as the underbelly of, of Europe, where malign influences are more easy, easily operated and where EU is expected to respond first in case of a crisis. Uh, this is why the issues such as bilateral issues, uh, conflicts internal between the countries, 
this is why EU has taken a lead in dealing with some of these issues, sometimes successfully, sometimes less successfully. Uh, but uh, when talking previously about total defense, uh, although this, this uh, term is not used within NATO context, uh, you hear a lot about resilience. So it's not just defense posture, it's not just the defense deterrent, it's also resilience within the countries. And I think that uh, we can separately and regionally do more, uh, but of course the geopolitical line of division of NATO and non-NATO countries makes some of this cooperation more difficult. This is why I think also cyber will be difficult domain for more open cooperation, because cyber has been defined as the new domain for NATO. And uh, when NATO members position themselves in terms of cyber security, they will position themselves based on NATO documents, NATO strategy, NATO-related cooperation, and this will impede some of the potential regional cooperation. <laughs> but this is probably where EU can kick in. Uh, European Union became very active with their peace um, uh, facility. Uh, this is the first time that we have seen their contribution into North Macedonia's uh, defense domain in terms of financial support, in terms of um, policy support as well. So if EU does more and better in defense and security, this will be probably the real potential for the region to do something more regionally, but within EU European format. framework, yeah, exactly. Do we have a question? Is that why you took the mic? Yeah. Yes, please. Hello, I'm Tomasz Kuchta, Czech ambassador. Thank you very much for very Thank interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I have one question. Uh, European Union leaders, uh, I think uh, 15 of them uh, uh, agreed that they will collect some money uh, to buy ammunition from third countries for Ukraine. Uh, do you think that North Macedonia could be one of the, uh, of the countries uh, which could uh, be uh, as a supplier? And what do you think about this, the Serbian case? Thank you. Because Serbia has a very efficient uh, grad rockets with the range of 40 kilometers, which is very, very convenient, very much convenient. And uh, what do you think about uh, this possibility of cooperation? Yeah, we didn't touch upon actually uh, exports in the arms industry. It's not a part of the report, but definitely very interesting uh, uh, topic. And uh, speaking about like the title of the panel behind the scenes, I think probably most of it is actually happening behind the scenes. So let's hear from our panelists. Uh, we, we do have uh, pr certain production of ammunition that has gone down years ago and then went up. Uh, I think that there were even some, some cooperation with Czech companies uh, in the past. Uh, and uh, uh, fortunately, there was a more serious investment a few years ago. So I think that they are already capitalizing on, on, on some of the increased appetite for ammunition. These days, it is extremely difficult to, to procure uh, ammunition even for the regular exercises. This has been one of the, one of the for, for the whole region. I think we have used our own capacity, but we have also uh, purchased from Bosnia, if I remember correctly, and even Serbia. Uh, uh, and uh, from what I heard unofficially, uh, there has been an increase in the capacity and a lot of expectations that this is where some of the ammunition will go to. But generally, there is big demand not only by the countries involved in full-scale war, but also others trying to, <coughs> to pile up some of their, their stocks. Uh, what we have seen lately is North Macedonia is one of the highest per capita contributor and supporter to Ukrainian capacities. And part of the reason was the old Yugoslav equipment, uh, which was some of it purchased from the Soviet Union and some of it actually uh, modernized in Ukraine. So this, it was very helpful for the Ukrainian uh, armed forces to actually take an equipment that they're used to, trained for, and that they can modernize relatively easy and maintain. 
Uh, so uh, I, I think the trend on supporting them military, militarily will uh, continue. And with regards to ammunition, if that can be also support for business, uh, I think uh, many people and many countries will be yeah. rather rather happy to, to chip in. Yeah. I think like situation in Serbia is a, a bit more complicated because of all the reasons that we mentioned, but who would like to answer um, that question, like what's position in Serbia in, in that regard? There is politics of it, right, whereby Serbia was selling ammunition Shyly. There is politics, <laughs> but there is also business. So. Yes, yes. Well, of course. I mean, and the question is, uh, who produces um, the ammunition? Who sells the ammunition? And uh, then we enter a domain that goes beyond business and goes into corruption. And I think, you know, uh, amongst the others, Birn was writing quite a lot about it. But uh, uh, the question is the politics as well. Serbia has been contributing ammunition to Ukraine, but very shyly, and using it as a chip to gain, to ingratiate itself with the West, uh, as Vuk was talking about earlier, um, but not publicizing this to the population as something boosting domestic production, you know, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of investments also in support in Serbian um, arms industry, like lately, obviously, as uh, said, like there is a lot of appetite, uh, um, and especially for this old arsenal um, that, that, that we have, um, but still not very popular topic, not, not only in Serbia, I've seen in report, if I'm not wrong, that many countries basically were not very open about uh, the the donations um, and, and uh, to, to, to the Ukraine. Is that correct? Well, what can I tell you? The defense industry folks are modest people. They're not interested in money and the fame. They're only interested in money. So <laughs> that's how, but uh, humor aside, I think that if you're asking me whether there would be an appetite for this type of project, I absolutely believe that none in the, Ser in the Serbian political elites nor the members of the Serbian defense industry would say no. At the end of the day, they are survivalists and pragmatists. And yes, they will be guided by these very two clear sets of criteria. The first, good old fashioned money. And the second one, what will be the foreign policy legitimacy of this decision? Whether this move will buy good political capital in the West and whether it will buy them a good form of external legitimization for the order which they have established domestically, which as we have seen from the last election is not always a pretty picture. Um, thank you. Uh, are there questions, uh, more questions? If not, I would, uh, yes, please. No, it was just uh, because we are co comment actually, because uh, we just barely scratched the surface of uh, of our report and uh, I just wanted to thank the entire team that uh, worked on it. Uh, Ivan Rankovic, uh, Milica Starinac, Maja Bielos and Vuk Vuksanovic uh, has been an incredible uh, team effort and um, quite a lot of resources of the organization employed to have it. So I really encourage everybody to read um, uh, the report yes, after our absolutely. discussion. As, as we said, like it's online, so you can uh, check it out and you know, see like much more data than we actually uh, mentioned today. It's very rich, let's say, like a basis on, based on which you can assess uh, the, the situation in the defense uh, these days. But there is one topic also that this report covers and we didn't touch upon and, and, and that is like the role of women in the in the military, in defense. Um, and this is obviously a another question for you. Um, considering that the Serbia is the only country from the region that didn't have like the woman in high structures of security, uh, which is a paradox as we can see from the report that like women are actually the biggest fans of the army, let's say, in that sense, or let's put it uh, differently, like much more interested uh, into finding jobs in the army. What would be your uh, recommendation for the Serbian establishment? Why they should have like a capable woman behind the wheel? Actually, another joke comes to my mind. Uh, 
uh, which which would be probably used as a, an argument against having a woman a defense minister, but uh, I started, so I cannot go back. Uh, when I was elected Minister of Defense, I was also the first female uh, Minister of Defense in North Macedonia, and we had, I think there was a reception by uh, the Montenegrin embassy in Skopje uh, after their NATO membership, and they said, listen, you know, you are the next one. I said, how come? Well, say, they, say, they said that there is a pattern. Once you elect the first female Minister of Defense, then you have a, a green light to enter, enter NATO. And in our case, it worked. Um, so, so I don't want to use this as a counter argument, <laughs> but uh, aside NATO membership, uh, uh, I, I was conf confronted with some skepticism initially. I mean, I have been in politics and politics is not so much female, friend, women friendly either, especially not in the Balkans. Uh, so I was used to it, but the army is a different animal. And you know, you immediately see the look. How can she tell us? You know, how can she understand the struggles we are, we are going through? She hasn't served in the army. Most of my male colleagues have not gone to the army either, <laughs> but they look military, I, I don't. So uh, I could understand the skepticism, and it's, it never works if you try to fight it directly. Uh, what I consider uh, one of my biggest personal accomplishments was that at the end of the mandate, many of them have said, well, you know, we are surprised. It took a woman to get more money into the military, to get us a better condition, salaries, equipment, etc., etc. So I, I do believe that sometimes we are we are better at at uh, establishing a system, and and really taking care after the different needs within the military. Uh, and I believe that it also provokes interest on behalf of female candidates to join the army to join the Ministry of Defense. Uh, two years after, after I was uh, elected, we have had an unprecedented situation in the military academy, 50-50 enrollment rate for girls and boys, or men and women. And part of it was seeing a female figure. I, I don't think that it's enough, but associating it differently, uh, uh, allowing people to think big, uh, uh, outside of the box, uh, I think it, it mattered. And the fact that we have raised the attention, okay, there are certain things like a uniform. I, I didn't even think about it. This, the uniforms are, were, were made to fit the male, male. body. No. <laughs> Nobody thought about having a female and male exchange room. And it did affect, especially women in the military. And then it's also part of the behavior that in the past was considered to be normal. For example, uh, we also have civilians in the army, psychologists, um, doctors, you know, IT experts, uh, engineers. And they said, you know, when we were recruited in the army, it was like 20 or 30 of us and only two women in the past. And immediately one of us was asked to go and prepare coffee for the rest of the group. And this was still, and in certain circles, it is still considered acceptable behavior. So uh, if I was not a woman, probably I would not have heard the story. Yeah. And, and I think it takes a <coughs> lot of sensitivizing. Uh, and I, 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 I was really glad that many of the colleagues, you know, generals and colonels, actually for the first time started seeing it through a different lens. And, and I believe that this was one of the really, really good uh, successes. We have another woman Minister of Defense. I do hope we will have the first general uh, in, in the army. Uh, and it's a process that you need to nurture. It's not a political decision that you can impose overnight. Uh, but I believe the more we open up, the more we discuss, uh, the more people are, are interested. And we have had one of our best uh, squad lead leaders uh, a young woman, very good, uh, physically very fit. Uh, from a point of view of leadership, she was considered to be one of the best leaders in the military. So I, I believe that we should talk more about these success stories. Because uh, I, I believe that sometimes the language of our resolutions, women, peace and security, is too bureaucratic. Yeah. I think we should talk more about you know, concrete stories that will convince mm. 
people that this is an area worth yeah. exploring. In the same tone, I wanted to thank you uh, actually for sharing some personal account on this because obviously, like as you said, sometimes it's very abstract language used in all this resolution while behind that there are actually people. Um, so just to conclude briefly, can we end then on a positive tone and say that the conclusion is that the conflict, at least on a larger scale, is not coming back to the Balkans, no matter the toxic narratives that we mentioned and uh, um, or invoking nationalism uh, that we are seeing like on a daily basis um, in, in some of the countries, basically, and, as we said, instrumentalization of the security for political goals. So, is that the conclusion? Well, it will be either a glass half full or half empty, depending on how you look at it. I will tell you right away the bad news first. I'm not entirely carefree about the option of uh, violence on a communal inter-ethnic level or perhaps some, mine or some violent uh, localized incidents like for example in North Kosovo. On these scenarios I'm not entirely uh, carefree. But when it comes to the memories of the 1990s, 1990s transpiring again, having full-fledged civil and interstate wars, that one I do not believe. The Balkans is much more uh, embedded in, uh, in a different security architecture than it was in the 1990s when Yugoslavia found itself in a quite a bit of a ideological and geopolitical vacuum. And at the same time, I also see that the societies are different. The region is demographically hemorrhaging. There is very, very little uh, to gain from armed conflict. And so this is given the topic as as pessimistic as optimistic as i can get <laughs> thank you as they say history does not repeat itself but it often rhymes so i i, I share this cautious view uh very few people expect repetitions but very few smart people exclude uh eliminate the potential of conflicts problems issues uh i was not so young when the wars in Yugoslavia broke. And I would say many people were shocked. So uh, I don't think that wishful thinking works in, in defense. Uh, I do believe that we, we, we have to prepare to prevent conflicts from happening. We need to invest, uh, not, we, we talked a lot about defense. I, I do believe that we need to invest more in, in good policies. Mm. Uh, there are successful cases, we didn't mention, this. there are several regional uh, security arrangements uh, for cooperation, like Sibri Group, it was located in Kumanovo in North Macedonia until recently, I think it moves somewhere else now. Uh, there, there is the Balkan Medical Task Force, good examples, I don't think that we are politically investing the, in them, we are investing money in them, but we are not using them as a political narrative that is different from the dangerous political narratives that uh, are dominant on our news. So we, should, we shouldn't think, we, we, we shouldn't wear our pink uh, glasses, but we should appreciate progress when it happens. Thank you. Follow up on that, just to say that, uh, to Uh, that uh, we look from the foundations that we cannot uh, expect uh, hybrid and authoritarian regimes uh, in this region uh, to deliver on many of the issues that we hope somehow they will de deliver, they will not. So I think we need to start first from the fundamentals, from the foundations, which is having uh, solid democracies across the Western Balkans, then we will not fight each other. Okay, thank you. Harun, your final take. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll be also very brief. I completely agree with the, with the, with the colleagues. I, I mean, I, when it comes to a larger scale conflict, I don't think that it would be in anybody anybody's interest uh, currently and to allow something like this to happen and I mean neither economically nor politically would it be an asset for for the countries of the region to to go into something uh, like this but as also the other colleagues put it you know you know what the saying is a spark can set a whole forest on, on fire and this is something we learn from the past and there are quite a few 
unresolved bilateral issues between the countries of the region, also including some border border issues. But uh, in general, I think we have to work on these questions, and as long as we work on them and try, at least try to 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 make some steps forward, then then we are on the good way. Okay, thank you very much. And I will just quote um, Radnila Shkirinska. She once said, and I remember that she said, like, the Balkan is a lacmus test for the EU ambitions. Uh, completely agree with that. So, um, speaking about the EU ambition to establish itself as a security player, it definitely makes sense to look more at the Western Balkans in that respect also. Thank you all for participation. I'm inviting you for a coffee break and see you later on the second panel. Thank you. Thank you.